Hello, I am Amara Jones, and welcome to our latest Translash Lives at Stake conversation. I'm the founder and creator of Translash. Translash is a project that focuses on spotlighting the stories of people of color at this time of social backlash. We have a very simple um, idea that if we tell trans stories, we'll help to save trans lives because we need to center our humanity in order to be able to survive and have a bright future to together. It's unfortunate and I can't believe that we still have to do that, but that's what this project is about. And today we are thrilled to be joined by Chase Strangio, who is the Deputy Director of Trans Justice at the ACLU. What we're going to be doing today is unpacking um, the Supreme Court cases from earlier this week that centered on whether or not people have the right to discriminate against people based on sexual orientation or gender identity. There's no greater issue besides perhaps violence against trans people than the access to jobs and employment. Nearly one out of four trans people have been fired from their jobs solely for being trans. Nearly three out of four trans people have experienced um, workplace discrimination and harassment. And so this case is central to our survival. Um, and when you layer on that the issues of race and poverty, it becomes even more acute. So that's why we're thrilled to be joined by Chase, who has masses of um, legal knowledge that stretch back not decades, almost decades? A decade. A decade, uh, a so decade. Of being a lawyer, but then I work, but I would say decades, perhaps. Okay, yeah. decades <laughs> of experience to help us unpack, if we include law school, right? If you include law school and then my paralegal days. Yeah. Okay, all right, yeah. Str stretching back to childhood. Yes, <laughs> I do the Hauser situation. Decades of, decades of experience. Um, arguing key cases from Chelsea Manning to being involved into uh, intimately in these cases before the Supreme Court. Also was active in sounding the alarm um, with Laverne Cox and Sada Ramirez and others, um, which has been essential and was an activist like at the court, um, in front of the court demonstrating and also inside. So we're gonna take us through all of that. But before we go through that, I just have a series of questions for you um, that are, have nothing to do with the cases before we get into that. So. It is my understanding that you know Laverne Cox. Uh, that I do know Laverne Cox. Okay, she is a friend of yours. Yes. If you were to text her, she would text you back. I mean, <laughs> I think so. Okay, yeah. like we would, we would assume so. Yes. So I just want you to let Laverne Cox know that she's not the only black <laughs> trans woman who has a rainbow clutch. I have to let everyone know that I bought this last year at Macy's on sale with a coupon, because you know you need to do that at Macy's, so I had this, right? Yeah. And I think I had it before she did. Definitely. Now, of course, um, I'm not Emmy nominated, and I didn't think to put like, you know, like the, the hashtag for the court cases on it. And of course, I wasn't on the red carpet with you. But I had it first. The, yeah, for sure. So, right? This yeah. would do. I, so, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. So when we take a course, so just let her know. I. Yeah, I'll make sure she knows that you originated the idea, clearly. Talk to me. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now that we have that like thing out of the way, um, um, let's go into these court cases. Okay. Um, I think one of the things before we actually dig in, and we're going to get wonky, um, one, so you can s sound smart at brunch over the weekend, but it's also the fact that I did a lot of research and so I want to use it, but it's also the fact that knowing the details of what happened is actually important to knowing um, what's actually at stake for our community and how we should respond if things go in a way that's not appropriate to us. So we're going to get wonky, so just hang in there with us. Um, I wanted to remind you uh, that we're going to go until 4 o'clock. At some point, we will be taking your questions. Make sure you put those questions in our timeline so that we can ask our legal expert here um, and tattoo expert um, <laughs> expert here, Chase, uh, relevant questions. Um, but um, So we'll be going into the details and getting wonky. I wanted to advise you on that. But before that, one of the questions that I've heard people ask in general is, why in 2019 are we talking about the legal ability to discriminate against anyone? Like, how is this actually even a series of cases? Yeah, I mean, I, and I think there's a number of answers to that question. And, and so starting in the like big picture sense, I think that as a general matter in the United States, we have not had very strong labor movements. And the labor movements have for a really long time been um, 
sort of squashed by capitalism and other you know forces that are very particular to the way that capitalism has developed in the United States. So I think as it, as it pertains to all workers, we live in a country where people are incredibly tenuously situated as to employment. And so one of the few things that we actually do have are non-discrimination protections in the law. Um, so that means that if you're working for a private employer, non-government, then you know you rely on statutory protections um, in federal law and state law or in local law. And if you work for the government, you also have the Constitution um, to protect you from discrimination. Um, but even when you do have non-discrimination laws, we've sort of developed our body of law around formal equality only. So you really still have to prove, even when you face discrimination, you still have to prove that they intentionally discriminated against you based on a protected characteristic. So even when the law is protective, it's not very protective. So I think that is an important context for like the paradigm that we're operating in in the United States. Then within that, um, only some characteristics are protected under the law. Um, and because of the lack of labor protections as a general matter, it means you can basically be fired for anything except if you are fired for uh, because of a particular characteristic. And under federal law, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which was passed in 1964, enumerated a list of characteristics that cannot be the basis for discrimination in the workplace. Um, what, you know, race, uh, national origin, religion, color, and sex. Mm -hmm. um, so that's federal law. It, at the state and local level, there are usually, in some, or in some cases, I should say, more expansive protections. Um, and that, you know, sometimes uh, sexual orientation and gender identity are explicitly enumerated under state law. But because the federal law covers the entire country, um, one of the ways that LGBTQ people have been able to secure protections is through Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Um, because discrimination against us is often thought of as sex discrimination. But the reason why we're still having these conversations in 2019 is because one, Congress is basically incapable of passing anything at this point. So expansion to civil rights law has not happened in many, many years. And efforts to explicitly add LGBTQ people as such to the federal civil rights law have been largely unsuccessful um, through Congress. Um, and that's increasingly so now because you know Congress is not passing anything. Um, and, and so I think it's a combination of sort of the failures of our legal system and the ways in which bias against workers generally and then against communities of people in particular have developed over the years. And so we've had to rely on the federal courts to enforce Title VII in such a way that is protective of us. But now we're in a world where the Trump administration is you know, committed to undoing that progress. And so here we are at the Supreme Court having this conversation in an incredibly precarious way. Right, so this was a thin veneer protection anyway um, at the federal level. And it's important because 28 states, it's legal to discriminate against LGBTQ people um, to be fired according to, to state law. And so therefore, the constitutional protections at the federal level are essential. Right? Yeah, so yeah. we need the federal stat. Yeah, so it's the, it's the, we need those protections at, at, at the federal level be, you know, because they are the ones that apply across the board. That's right. Um, and so that, and, and we've been able to get them um, through the courts. Um, but this is sort of now the question that is before the Supreme Court. Right. So it's important for people to know that um, these cases are actually, or this case, this one it was one argument, but it's actually three cases. Correct. And yeah. three cases in one. The first is Air Life Express uh, versus Zarda. The second is Bostock versus Clayton County. Those two are um, uh, sexual orientation discrimination cases that the court sort of bundled into one argument, mm -hmm. right? And then we have Harris Funeral Home, Home versus EEOC, which is Amy Stevenson's case, who um, is a trans woman, and that is a sex discrimination case, right? Gender identity case. Uh, but the court decided to just wrap all of those up into one giant argument. Um, and those arguments, um, you know, there were two sets of arguments, right? You were mm -hmm. in, in the room. Um, and can you just take us through what the legal turn here was? I think the idea here, or the legal argument, right, is does when the when the when Title VII was passed, when the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964, did the term sex apply to sexual orientation and gender? And I think on the sexual orientation case, right, um, the idea is that if you are fired for loving someone who is of the same sex as you, 
Um, that is sex discrimination because if that person was of the opposite sex, you would be you would have not been discriminated against, right? And then for Amy's case, the um, the Harris Funeral Home, she actually said, "I'm transitioning," and they said, "Well, we're firing you." And the argument is, well, if you were if she was born or assigned female at birth um, and lived her life as a woman, she wouldn't be discriminated against. But because she was born um, and assigned uh, a male gender at um, birth and then transitioned to be a woman, then um, that's sex discrimination, right? But can you just take us through like the legal wrangling around this definition of sex? Why does it all turn on that? Well, yeah, actually, so we would say it doesn't turn on that. And that, okay. so the other side has really been pushing, like, this is a redefinition of sex under Title VII, right, and right. that sex, you know, couldn't have meant that in 1964. But the right. reality is that federal law doesn't have a definition of sex. And actually, the sort of operative term is because of sex. So the question really is, why were you discriminated against? Was it because of your sex? Um, and the law protects individuals. So it's not like groups of men and groups of women. It's like, what happened right. to you, individual employee? Um, and so the the arguments you know that you, that you laid out we think are very straightforward and that um, the point that we, we made to the court in our briefing and in, in argument was, you know what, you don't have to define sex because even if you take the narrowest definition of sex, the definition that everyone agrees is at least part of Title VII, which is a sex assigned at birth, let's assume that's all it means because we don't want to get into what sex meant in 1964 because that's not relevant, we still win. And the reason we still win is sort of what, what you said. It's but for someone's sex, they wouldn't be fired for having a same-sex attraction. And, and you know, we had these like simple little like, um, Examples like if Donna, if like Donna and John both marry Bill over the weekend, but only John gets fired, that is because of his sex. End right. of story. And if, you know, if like Amy, if two Amy's come into work and one was assigned male and one was assigned female, but only the one assigned male gets fired, it's but for her sex. And so under like the simplest textual analysis, we should win. Um, mm. And we, we argued the case in that way for, for two reasons. One is, is because it's right, and, and two, it's a very conservative approach to the law. And so we're before a conservative court, and conservatives are known as textualists. And so we, in appealing to Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, who are known to have these uh, sort of textualist approaches to statutory interpretation, we're like, look, Kavanaugh, look, Gorsuch, your sort of way of thinking about the law fits on our side this time. Um, because we're not making a policy argument about why we should be covered. We're not saying what Congress intended in 1964. We're just saying no matter how you define this word sex, if you follow the words of the statute, we win. And we've had a ton of success in the lower courts with conservative judges because they're like, Sorry, it is sex is sex. It's sex discrimination. If you fire someone for changing sex in your mind, that's sex discrimination. I can't, you know, if you fire someone because they have an attraction to someone of the same sex, all you're saying sex like 300 times. And so we've had judges, right, like conservative judges, right, like one paragraph opinions that are just like, it's sex because it's sex. Sorry, other side, go to Congress if you're not happy. Um, and so that, you know, that was sort of the approach. And I think. It's deeply unsatisfying to a lot of people because it's not particularly affirming. It's right. not like trans people have dignity and should be seen in our full humanity and should like not be fired for who we are. It's very reductive. It's it, yeah, yeah, and it's just it's and and the reality is is you know if it were a constitutional case that might be a little bit more what we see where you're making a case about the history of discrimination. But under a statutory case, it's really the question before the court is what does the statute mean and apply to. And so, you know, the I think that our task was to say the statute means broadly that you cannot take sex into account in the workplace and we win no matter how you define sex and that should be the end of the story. I think the big question is is, you know, law is not a, a, a science and and so, you know, these justices have principles that they generally apply, but they often change them to serve political goals. Right. And so the question is, are we going to win on the law because we have a straightforward legal argument, or are we going to lose because of politics? Right. I mean, what that was, it's interesting because the cons very narrow conservative argument that you made, like, 
um, put some of the conservative justices in a in a vise, like it tied them up. Yep. Um, and um, it tied them up because, as you say, Gorsuch, Alito, all of them, they kind of rose with this um, conservative philosophy and were pushed um, by conservative legislatures, uh, the Congress, elevated to these positions through the Senate because of their essential idea that, well, liberals basically have gotten all these rights because they've had an expansive def uh, interpretation of the Constitution, seeing things there that are not written on the page. So our argument is that, so now from now on, we're only going to go with what's written on the page, and then that will help to usher in a new conservative era because we'll be reducing what's possible through these legal definitions, right? But you all said, all right, well, let's, if, that, if that's the ball, if that's the ball yeah. game, we're going to play that. Let's play that. Mm -hmm. And we have this very narrow definition. And I'm wondering, from what I read, there is a really tense moment in the court. You were actually in, in the chamber, and I'm wondering what this was like to see unfold where um, this argument was made, like Gorsuch, this is sex, you gotta, this is it, you gotta rule on this. And I think he said something like, well, this could lead to like extreme social consequences. Social upheaval. Social upheaval, uh, yes. right? Oh my God. Yeah. It's um, very scary. Yeah. Uh, the climate change, no, but this, but, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, will lead to like an apocalypse, um, you know, if we do this thing. Right, so on this, they tie themselves, and I'm wondering when you saw that exchange about this leading to social upheaval, like what was that like? What did you feel happened in the room when that ex when he said that? Yeah, so so there so there was this, the moment, just as as you say, where so it's uh, our side is arguing, and and Gorsuch is is sort of saying, well. Sure, there is some textual, you know, I get what you're saying, that you, it does have a textual basis, but um, sort of wouldn't, wouldn't if this court were to rule for you, wouldn't that cause mass those social upheaval? Um, and David, the legal director at the ACLU who's arguing, sort of tries to jump in and says, well, no, they're, they're letting transgender people live in the world is not gonna cause massive so social upheaval, in fact, there are transgender people in the courtroom today following the, you know, so so he does this thing and Gorsuch, it's interesting because there's this moment where David says there are transgender people in the courtroom today following the dress code and then Gorsuch says, of course there are. Um, and that moment was really interesting because it's like, okay, so we're at a point where Justice Gorsuch is fully aware that there's trans lawyer members of the Supreme Court bar in the courtroom before him. So that to me, it was like an interesting moment of recognition that we exist. Now, this was not an affirming experience, but the very fact that there was an acknowledgement of trans existence as part of the sort of very particular cultural realm of the Supreme Court was, was interesting. It was a change. Um, and so then, but then Justice Gorsuch gets frustrated and says, no, you're not answering my question. Um, you know, what, obviously this isn't what the legislature intended in 1964. And, and, and so then he starts to, to walk himself away from textualism. Um, and and sort of he's he's sort of then desperate when the other side gets up for them to give him a textual reason to rule for them, and they really don't have one. And then Justice Kagan interjects, and Kagan is the ultimate strategist, and says she's an Obama appointee. She's an Obama appointee, and she says to Noel Francisco, the uh, the Solicitor General for the United States, who argues at the Supreme Court on behalf of the United States, she says, so let me just get this straight. If there is no textual basis to support your position, you lose, right? And he says, well, yes. So then it's sort of like he's boxed into the recognition that if they can't come up with a textual argument in support of their position, then they do lose. And Gorsuch knows that as well, particularly for the philosophy that you know the court has really taken on in the last 10 years. Um, and this, just to you know get super wonky and about it all, is also was Justice Scalia's philosophy and his approach to the law. Um, and in a case called um, On Call, which was about same-sex sexual harassment on an all-male oil rig, um, all the lower courts said, no, no, that's not covered by Title VII. It gets up to the Supreme Court. Scalia writes an opinion for, the nine, for a 9-0 unanimous court saying, it may be true that Congress never intended in 1964 to have sexual harassment covered at all in the days of madmen-like exchanges right, in the right. workplace, but it doesn't matter what Congress intended because they wrote a broad statute, they used the word sex, that's the end of the story. And so that's sort of the dynamic that was like coming out and then 
Um, I think Gorsuch was really wrestling with that, and you could see it. He was the most active questioner. He was clearly the person who um, was seen by everyone as the potential swing. Um, he, you know, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, though Kavanaugh barely said anything. Um, and so, you know, I think it was a moment where um, we were very much pushing that the text alone is enough to rule for us, and that if if this court is going to continue its uh, approach to statutory interpretation, then the logical conclusion is that we win this case. Um, and in the and in the process, you know, we did, you know, we did, you know, on behalf of our binary trans client, and um, in order to deflect away from the specter that all sex specific rules would collapse, you know, David in, made the point that there are tra there are trans people in the courtroom, and the men are the trans men are following the, the dress code for men, and the the women are following the dress code for women, and and not there is no social. Upheaval. Upheaval. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of how it landed. And, and a bunch of people wrote, a bunch of legal scholars wrote after two to remind Gorsuch that there's no social upheaval exception to textualism. That's just a policy argument, which is supposedly anti textual in right. nature. Anti everything they say yeah. that everything's going to be yeah. based on. So um, before we move on to the future and what this means, I want to begin to take some um, questions mm -hmm. from those um, watching. So as I've said before, when I pick up my phone, I'm not checking Tinder, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Um, hearing from you. Um, but while I sort of pull some of those, um, let me ask you another question and I will glance through um, right now. Switching gears from the law, from inside the chamber to outside, you know, this was a this was a moment where there were masses of trans people who showed up at a place where masses of trans people normally don't show up, um, which was in front of the court to argue our humanity and our role in society. And I'm wondering just for you as a Person, as a trans person who spent lots of you know hours in courtrooms in stacks solitary what that experience was like to be there in a totally different environment yeah I mean I think it was really mm. amazing I mean, it was amazing for, for so many reasons um, you know one is that it was a hard argument to be a part of it was a hard case to litigate um, because we were sort of litigating our existence and then we get out of the court and, and Amy our client you know who has you know, she was fired in 2013, which means she's been fighting this case for six years, um, and her health is um, is not great, and which is just a consequences of losing losing her job and her health insurance and all the things. And yeah. so she's sitting through that argument. We all are, and then we sort of come around the outside of the court when it's over, and there's just you know hundreds of people chanting, "We love you, Amy," and it was so it was like so affirming and so beautiful, and like that. That, you know, we're, ne we're never going to win or lose in the courtroom. It's ultimately like, what right. are we going to build as a community? And I think that moment for me was like, we have already won. We already, mm. you know, we already are here together in solidarity, showing that like, you may be scared of us in your mind, but we are not scared of ourselves. We are empowered, and I think that felt really amazing. That's amazing. Um, <clears throat> um, so there are a couple of questions. Um, one, actually, Faith Cheltenham asked a question similar to this, but even more personal, which was, um, what was it like for you personally to be defending your own community in the court, essentially helping to craft a case that ensures your own personal rights? I mean, for so I I'm like used to this. It's my it's my job, and so I think partly I'm like probably like I always say I'm like really compartmentalized because I've like put away a lot of the pain, I think, of what it requires in, in it. But I also, like, I get paid to do it. Like, it's like there, there's a lot of security that I have that other people don't have. So, like, I get paid. I have job security because of it. Like, they're not going to fire me because I'm trans. They hired me because I'm trans, you right. know? So I think there, there's that, like, reality. And then I do feel like as a white lawyer, I have all this access, so so it's my responsibility to put my body on the line in, in all these ways, you know. And and of course, there are times when it feels deeply painful to sort of hear all the horrible things that people say. Right. But I would much rather be present than absent, you know. And, and so even like you know, every one of those lawyers on the other side had to sit in the room before with me beforehand, shake my hand, look me in the eye. Wow. Every justice had to look, you know, right, you know, right at us. Right. So. I know, you know, 20 years ago, there would be no trans people there. That's right. You know, and so what does it say that now, you know, they have to look at us and they and they and they know I'm trans. I mean, I wrote a, I had a piece in the Washington Post the morning of the argument, right. you know, talking about being a trans lawyer on the case. And so I think that disrupts 
the ability to sort of talk about us as if we don't exist. That's they right. maybe they think we don't exist on some level, but we're like right there in their face. And it's like, okay, John Birch arguing that all trans people are frauds, like you're saying that you're you're looking at me now. And so that, you know, that it, some people don't care, but some people are it gives them pause. Right. And so that helps us in the long run. So I'm willing to sort of take that on. Wow. That's yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the whole argument that being there forces them to deal with us, right? Yeah. In a very personal way. Um, Alex Cooper Webster asks, um, um, what was the the process for determining who argued before the court? So who decided that, you know, Pamela Carlin and David Cole, who decided these people would argue? <laughs> Such a loaded question. Okay, so, um, so there's- Can you uh, tell us? Uh, I can tell you, I can't tell you everything. Well, so on the sexual orientation side, that was decided earlier. It was like Pam has sort of, the Supreme Court is, a, is an interesting body, and there is a, a group of lawyers that are sort of considered the, the, the sort of elite of the Supreme Court bar and the people who argue frequently. Huh. Um, and that group has gotten smaller and smaller over the years. It used to be that people would argue their own cases, and it's it's largely true now that a small select group of lawyers argues. Um, oh, interesting. And um, most of them are white, most of them are men, all of them are cis, most of them are straight, um, and, and there's a lot of criticism of that. The reality is that the more you do it, the more comfortable you are. The more comfortable mm. you are, the more comfortable the justices are. So True. there's just a lot of dynamics at play. Mm. Um, there is this um, really, so there's a movie called On the Basis of Sex. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's 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 a it's a scripted film about RBG's oh, right. like early, aspect, early um, career. Right. And there's this moment in the film where she's getting ready to bring a case to the 10th Circuit, which is a, a federal court of, court of appeal. Um, in the West, um, and her, you know she's working with her husband on the case, and they're they're doing a moot, um, which is like a, a practice argument before a panel in, of judges, including the legal director from the ACLU and Polly Murray, who is you know was a, a brilliant um, black uh, lawyer uh, who who sort of what preceded RBG and, and was sort of instrumental in a lot of the thinking. That part's irrelevant, but I just wanted to add it in. Um, so they're doing this moot, and and sort of RBG is 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 struggling. And getting really emotional because it's a fact. It's like the sex discrimination arguments feel really personal. Then her, so they pause and break. And Marty, um, no. So then the ACLU person who's playing the ACLU legal director is like yelling at her and saying, "You're not doing it right." And Marty, your husband, is like, "What about trying it this way?" Then the ACLU legal director jumps in and says, "Marty should do the argument. Marty should do the argument. Like you can't do it, Ruth." Um, and such a poignant moment for anyone who practices law as a litigator in the civil rights space because there's all these dynamics about when whose voice will be heard and why. Mm. Um, and there's some strategy calls about it. It's like, okay, if you feel personally implicated, are you the right person? Are you the wrong person? Do you want the justices to feel like they're learning something by your existence? Or do you want them to feel comfortable with the person who's talking to them because that person seems more similar to them? Mm. Um, and I think there's just a lot of questions that go into who are use it on on our case it was a robust conversation um, and you know ultimately I'm really happy with how David did the argument um, and I'll leave it at that <laughs> <laughs> uh, whoa yeah. okay uh, moving <laughs> on uh, moving on um, so, um, Carrie Gleason asked, we'll move on from that, that's, that's like dynamite. Um, can you, one person, and this relates to something that happened in real time today, both um, on your timeline in The New Yorker, um, uh, as we were saying before, um, uh, Masa in piece, um, in, the, um, in The New Yorker, who's a, who's a non-binary journalist, someone asked, can you speak to how non-binary gender identities were handled in the court today. Yeah, I mean, I think, and this is like one of these areas where, um, you know, I think two things were going on. So we had sort of one was our client. And so we're like defending the facts of the case involving our client. And our client was a binary identified, um, you know, or a sort of, yeah, she, she's just a binary trans person. Um, and then the sort of other side's argument in the case was about 
sex specific dress code saying oh well she was going to break our dress code which by the way was a dress code that required for, you mean for Amy's for case for Amy's case that required women to wear skirts and men to wear pants but she told them that she was going to do that well right? she told them she was going to follow the dress code okay. she did she just she actually all she said was i'm going to come to work in professional business attire um so the dress code was never discussed they fired her before there was any meaningful discussion of the dress code in litigation before the Supreme Court, they made a big deal about two things. One, about how she was really fired for not complying with the dress code, which was an argument that was rejected in the lower courts because they never discussed the dress code. In their mind, had she followed the dress code for women, that would be violating the dress code because she was and would always be a man to them. Right. Um, and then the other argument that both the United States made and the, her employer, represented by ADF, made was if trans people are covered under the law, then all sex-specific rules will collapse. Meaning that if you open the door to these protections, then we'll then the law will not permit uh, sex-separated bathrooms, sports teams, locker rooms, and dress codes. Wow. So this was the like parade of horribles that they put forth before the court. So one of the big questions was, how can we comfort the court that this case won't decide those other cases, um, and also remind the court that actually that question questions of sex-specific rules isn't before them. Right. Um, so the case really was about if you fire someone for being trans, is that because of sex? Right. And our point was if you fire someone because you enforce a rule that is because of sex, so let's say you fire me because I go to the men's bathroom and you think that's wrong, Yeah. you've enforced a sex-specific rule against me. So it's already because of sex. So there's a different legal test of whether it's illegal. So we tried to do this. Well, there's two steps, and, and, and this case only implicates one, and, and other cases implicate a totally different set of questions. And we basically let, say, said, as to both binary, non-binary, cis, everyone, that the question would be, you know, does it, it, does it discriminate in a person's terms and conditions of employment to exclude them from a particular sex-specific space? And we tried to make it clear that, you know, a, trans, a binary trans person would have one claim, a non-binary person would have another claim, yeah. a cis person would have another claim. Um, it would just be dependent on the particulars of the individual because Title VII is all about the individual. I think that you know, the challenge was that the justices, um, you know, there is a sex-specific dress code in the Supreme Court. Um, so they are obviously operating in a world, and not to mention that there are, you know, men's and women's bathrooms. Um, so we certainly did not go in there and say all sex-specific rules are illegal under Title VII. Uh, it's also the case that, I mean, to be honest, like, you know, <clears throat> to, you know, driving kind of the, the, the finer point that you made is that that question wasn't before the no, court. No, it was right? not before the court. And so, like, the thing that I think is important is that issues of non-binary or a whole host of other, not even bathroom, even though they wanted to keep talking about bathrooms, that wasn't the thing that they were deciding on. They're deciding whether or not you can discriminate against someone solely because of sex. Solely they, because they're trans and whether that is, yeah. So, yes, and they nothing about dress codes, locker rooms, sports, bathrooms, was part of the case. Right, right, right. And um, I mean, and I think that that's important for people to remember. And I think that the court has signaled that they, interestingly, separately, want to take up a bathroom case, right? Well, I mean, it's also like the way these, these cases, too, are really just this intellectual engagement. It's like they like going down the slippery slope path. Well, what mm -hmm. happens if we rule for, for you? Like, does it really mean they want to take on that case? Maybe, maybe not. Or do, does it mean that they just want to point out what they believe are weaknesses in the case that you brought before them? And, and you know, we never know why they're asking the questions. Um, and I think that it's really easy to sort of look at something like a Supreme Court case and the constraints of that, that style of litigation and think, oh, the movement as a whole has sort of decided that you know, we're not going to challenge sex separation in different contexts. And I just don't think that's that's true. I think that in each of these moments, we're accounting for, like, the demands of our client and the demands of the, the, the court, but that, you know, it, it, this case wasn't a case about access to a sex-specific space. This was about can you be fired for being trans, full stop, and trying to sort of, you know, before a very conservative court, make the strongest argument that we could um, I think that, unfortunately, I, I think the LGBT movement and the entire women's rights movement haven't done enough to challenge the way that sex stereotypes have been enforced in a host of contexts. That's right. Um, but that doesn't mean that this is the moment to then say, 
um, we have to do all that work right now when there has been no like work done, at least in the courts, to build up to that place. And so I think it's just about you know really thinking through as we witness the toleration and actually like sort of commitment to allowing for sex segregation. Um, as we witness all of that, what is it that we want to do to try to challenge it? Like, why do we feel okay about sex-specific dress codes and restrooms? Um, that's a that's a big question, but it wasn't the question before the court. Yeah, I think um, I think that's really important, and it's also again, this was it's hard. It would be hard to make that broad argument because this was a narrow case, right? It's mm -hmm. deciding one aspect of what what it's two aspects of one word of a law and a civil rights act, right? That's that's yeah. it. Um, so let's let's play out what the justices do in court for our community with you. Um, um, let's, um, and before I actually ask this question, I just wanna remind everyone, we are a little bit more than halfway through, so make sure that you are putting your questions or additional questions in the timeline so that we can ask Chase, this is your only time. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is it, uh, last chance saloon. Um, so let's play out some scenarios, right? So what happens, what's the implication, what does it mean if the court rules in favor um, of you know, the, the three plaintiffs? I mean, so, you know, it, they could rule in favor of them in a host of ways. So this is like the beginning of the speculation of like the matrix of possible outcomes. And, right. and so let's say we get like a full win that says it is per se sex discrimination under Title VII to discriminate against someone just because that person is LGBTQ. Right. Um, I think that would be like a clean victory. Um, I, I, on one level, it wouldn't change much because that is what the law has been. The lower courts have largely mm. held that, particularly for trans folks. Trans people have been um, pro getting protections under federal sex discrimination laws in the appellate uh, federal courts since 2000, oh, wow. relatively consistently. Um, not everywhere, um, and there's not like the cleanest, you know, Rulings. ruling because there was nothing from the Supreme Court. But it has consistently been true, and then it also allowed for like the Obama administration. All of the guidance documents and regulations that they put forth were dependent on this argument. So when they put out the trans student guidance, that was based on the idea that Title VII's protect Title IX's protections um, for students on the basis of sex included trans students. Affordable Care Act, health care, you know, Fair Housing Act, housing, all of that is sort of been utilized by the, uh, the, the Obama administration to protect us. So in one sense, it wouldn't be a change. It would be holding the line. It would be yeah. clarifying it for sure in, in a sort of incredibly important way. It would also then allow for the next president, who is not Trump, the, a Democratic president, to actually bring back a lot of the things that we had um, and go further, sort right, of so take these arguments and allow us to get executive agency protections. Right, so it would just basically allow things to be frozen at the status quo and maybe provide the opportunity to go back to where we were in 2016. Yeah, and to and if there was a creative person in office who could then say, oh, like I'm gonna go even further than those regulations. Right, based upon this ruling. Based on this ruling. So I think that there's a, a lot of potential um, and, and certainly like that, you know, that could have, you know, that that is a holding the line, like, ultimate goal of this decision. Now, even a win could come with a lot of bad language in it. So let's say they mm. want to rule for us, but say a bunch of, like, horrible things about bathrooms or locker rooms or sports. You know, there's always the possibility that they throw in what's called dicta, which is not binding because it's not directly addressing the question before it. It's but dicta? Dicta. Oh. But it sort of is then picked up on other cases. Like, we'll take dicta from other cases and, and use it to our advantage, and so will the other side. So there's a lot of ways it could be written. So if that's like a win plus other things that are not helpful, but we still win, we still can use that, um, that's sort of what that would look like. So um, there's a clean win, there's a mixed win that would be a little muddy. So what are the implications if they rule against? Yeah, and then there's a bunch of different ways they can rule against us. Um, I think, like, you know, there's also the reality that they could rule for the trans case and against the sexual right. orientation or for that's sexual right. orientation, you know, so that, that trans. Yeah, so, like, that's a, a scary thing to think about, too, is sort yeah. of what happens if the community is split in that way. Because that's traditionally what's happened in Washington. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, so we definitely see that. Um, and, and it would be harder here, um, but, you know, that's what happened with 
you know, the Perry Prop 8 case and the Doma, Windsor, the Doma case, they, you know, they, we, we sort of won Windsor and lost Perry. Um, but I think that let's just assume it's a across the board loss. I mean, there's two, so, and then there's two sort of types of losses. There's just sort of a loss that's specific to LGBTQ people, yeah. uh, which would be a horrible. And then there's an even broader loss that does what the Trump administration and the employers are asking, which is really to roll back protections for everyone under wow. Title VII. Um, because since 1989, at least, and, and definitely before, Title VII, um, under the Supreme Court's precedent, has made clear that you can't discriminate based on sex stereotypes. And when you think about discrimination against LGBTQ people, it's mostly based on stereotypes about how men and women should you know, identify, look, behave. Um, and the Trump administration is really asking for a significant rollback of that holding from 1989 and to sort of allow employers to enforce sex stereotypes in the workplace as long as they do it against men and women. So the idea being, well, you can fire a woman for being insufficiently feminine as long as you fire a man for being insufficiently masculine. It's mm. like two wrongs make a right. right. Some like perverse, weird argument. So if the court were to take that up, it would mean not only sort of a massive transformation in the protections for LGBTQ people, but for anyone who departs from sex stereotypes, which could be like the gender nonconforming woman in presentation. It could also be like the father who wants to leave at five and take care of his kids. Um, so if that... You know, if we have those sort of massive loss like that, um, it could implicate so many people. And then the question is... It's like Republic of Gilead stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. No, it is. And that's sort of what they want. It's like scary. It's like they believe yeah. in this gender complementary idea where there's is it grounded in heterosexuality? It's grounded in the subservient life. Like, it, it, it's... We're not that far from Handmaid's Tale, like right. in the world that they're like encouraging the court to right through get, the law, through the law, and to sort of you know they are thinking of themselves in that in that way. Um, and then you know such a loss that I mean the way to fix it, the way to sort of undo it in some ways that would it wouldn't even be immediate is to pass the Equality Act, which is you know currently pending in Congress, pass the House, um, which would expand protections explicitly for sexual orientation and gender identity right. and sex under federal law um, because currently under federal law there are no sex protections in public accommodations um, oh, wow. going back to um, because title two of the Civil Rights Act people didn't want to ha um, add sex for fear that it would end collapsing bathrooms everyone is always anxious about bathrooms um, so it would the Equality Act would not only explicitly add sexual orientation and gender identity but it would also expand the context in which civil rights laws uh, exist for everyone um, so that is currently passed the House. Obviously, Mitch McConnell is not going to do anything with it in the Senate. Um, so the 2020 election is, is critical, not just on the president's side, but on the Senate side, too. Um, so, uh, Theo, that's the answer to your question. Like, we, he, you know, he already answered it, so we don't have to answer it again. Um, was, was what happens um, if they rule against? Going on this the question of the Equality Act, it came up over and over at last night's I guess I could charitably describe it as topsy turvy um, town hall, yeah. maybe hot ass mess town yeah, hall, yeah. Um, LGBTQ town hall, um, and everyone kept saying, "Well, if the Supreme Court rules, we'll just pass the Equality Act." Yes, and that's just like a super. So I think that, that that's a lazy answer for a number of reasons. Um, and I, I didn't watch the town hall because I feel like there all of the candidates have been sort of mm. really lazy in a lot of ways around LGBTQ mm. um, stuff and saying like really simple things like marriage equality. It's like marriage equality. That's like a great. That's wow. Way to take a stand. Um, <laughs> to and be like, out there on yeah, the cutting yeah, edge. Yeah, that's like ten years old. Um, so like you know, and like the trans military ban and um, you know conversion therapy and the Equality Act. Those are all good things. They're just super not transformative every democrat supports it's not it doesn't say anything about what you'll actually do if you say those things and i think as to the sort of congressional i will sign the equality act what we need to hear is a an understanding of how damaging it would be if there were a loss because you know it's not like congress can just fix it right away it means losing all the protections we've relied on that's right all the regulations and sub regulatory like enforcement of those laws starting to like unravel um, that's so right. those are affirmative things like we're not talking about abstract equality we're talking about the sort of affirmative mandates that have allowed people to get access to healthcare housing shelter uh, school without you know to 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 stay in school all things that keep people from 
homelessness, keep people from being funneled into the criminal legal system or being subject to street-based violence. And so, it, and so right. this is like, there are material things at risk. And so what, just saying I would sign the Equality Act does nothing, because yeah, sure, any Democrat is gonna sign the Equality Act, but we have to figure out what is the path to the Equality Act, and what is the path to a clean version of the Equality Act? Because you better believe, if we lose these cases and there's pressure, that people are gonna push for a very compromised version of the Equality Act. And the things that are gonna get compromised away pretty quickly are trans people, <laughs> a trans, especially trans people in the context of single sex spaces. Like we're gonna see restroom exemptions, we're gonna see uh, you know, like efforts to exempt restrooms, efforts to ex exempt sports, efforts to expand religious exemptions, which will hurt trans people in the context of Catholic hospitals and other places and like where people access healthcare, particularly in rural um, environments. And so it's not enough to just say you would sign the Equality Act. We need to know from a anyone, like, well, what, how will you get us there? What will you do in the middle, in the meantime? How will you save people's lives? And what creative arguments will you use if we do lose the rights that we've relied on? Because um, if you're all, if you get up there and say, I want to stop the murders of black trans women, that's how? And one of the ways you can say how is you say, I am going to change the material conditions under which people live. And I can do that in the following ways. Grounded in, this, in this, yeah. Grounded in like how to get people housed, yeah. how to get people money. And and under, and, the and under the law, and sort of saying like you know if 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 we're just going to provide platitudes about uh, you know nothingness, then that's just like not a real. That's not anything. So yeah. Yeah, and I I think um, you know that what's what's cheap about that in a certain way is that there's not a specific answer that they give for how to bridge from where we are to a signed equality act. Yeah. You know, yeah. like there's this huge gap that they just leap out, well, I'm just gonna sign it. Yeah. Or um or we'll just have a democratic senate. But those are magical, realistic yeah. answers yeah. not relevant to where we actually are. And as you say, everything hangs on this this interpretation. Yeah, and, and I think too if if we learned anything from the Obama administration is that you know Congress is going to block things every step of the way, and so being creative and actually investing in sort of transformative change is going to take a lot more than just I will sign a bill that gets to my desk. It's no, I want to understand how you're going to deal with the sort of painful, sort of you know symbolic change, but also legal material change if we lose at the Supreme Court in the midst of a climate where people are being physically attacked in the streets. So right. that just requires a lot more than I'm gonna just take my pen and sign something. Right. So um, going back, we, we did um, have uh, a, another tactical question um, that that came through um, from um, Alice Cooper who wants to know where do you think, if at all, the fifth vote comes from, right? So. Let's go back out of this, you know, what if the sky falls yeah. argument. And, you know, tactically, when you're looking at the nine people who are up there, where is the fifth vote to save us from, you know, the, the possible worst outcome? Um, yeah, so I, I, I first, I don't take any of the four liberal votes for granted. I mean, I think on some level, like, hopefully they're with us. Um, but I think, you know, some of the questioning from Ginsburg and Sotomayor suggested that mm. they were confused enough about trans people that I, I don't think that they're going to rule against us but it was a, it was sort of a stark reminder that we have to do the work big time to like pull people along who should be with us um, I think that I, I think we will get the four that's so that that's Sotomayor that's Sotomayor Ginsburg Breyer and Kagan they're the four liberals so the question is out of the other five how do we get one more because we can only win if we get if we get five um, so you have to figure that uh, Thomas and Alito are most likely out of the question. Um, so that leaves Gorsuch, uh, Kavanaugh, and Roberts. Um, Roberts is sort of thought of as the swing in, in the post-Kennedy uh, world, and um, he is the chief. I think on a statutory question, which this is, that he is unlikely to be our fifth vote. Um, I think hmm. that it is far more likely um, that, our, that if we have a fifth, it is Gorsuch or Kavanaugh. Um, and that based on um, the text, uh, and they are sort of literal uh, textuals. Um, they are sort of um, very much anti-legislative intent, anti-policy making in the courts. Um, and so I think if they truly follow the text as they sort of principally claim to want to do, 
then we should win. We, that we should win 6-3 at least. Now, will we win? I don't know. Um, because you never know, and I think it's also the case that, um, I mean, I don't, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know their personal feelings, but I think it's, it's unlikely that they would, as a policy matter, want us to win. But as a legal matter, they may feel compelled to rule for us. Um, so I think that that's sort of the most likely place that we would get this in. Right. I mean, they can also do all these really weird things where they could rule now, and because they know that they're playing the long game on the court, they're going to be there for years, and there may be other opportunities for them to tighten, to shade, to undermine yeah. rulings in the future. Right? Yeah, and I think one of the big things is that, you know, it's a it's a deeply religious court. I think that, it, you know, this is... Yeah, they have like a prayer meeting that I learned about. Did you know about this? No, I didn't. It's like Thomas and like there's a group of the justices that do meet weekly for like a prayer meeting, like a Bible reading and a prayer meeting. Yeah, I mean the government is like getting closer and closer, like intertwined with religion, and I think there is a, a deep, you know, and I, you know, I'm like a, a you know a, a huge supporter of the free exercise of religion. I think it's essential. It's it's difficult to watch because they also upheld the Muslim ban, you know, and so it's sort of like you start to see, well, how does this free exercise work? Is it really there for everyone? Um, but because of that, I would say that it is possible that they would say, okay, fine, you're covered under the statute, and then in the next set of cases, begin to carve out religious exemptions under the Constitution, um, and sort of what like what happened in Masterpiece Cake Shop, sort of paving the way for um, generally applicable non-discrimination laws, like you know the law at issue in the Colorado case where it was just a prohibition on discrimination, um, and then they would say as applies to certain employers who are you know who are religious. Yeah. Um, then perhaps they would they would chip away um, at non-discrimination in that way. Um, so there's definitely opportunities for them to take away our rights, even if they give some now. Um, and they already took up a big abortion case this term, so um, you know they will have plenty of opportunities to sort of really you know sort of dangerously restrict people's rights. Wow. So we have just seven minutes left. So any other questions, please make sure that you post them on the timeline so that we can ask them. Questions, comments, someone commented, Faith commented on my purse. We welcome that. Um, one of the things that's interesting, I think, about you and the way that you approach this case in particular, but um, overall, is that you clearly see that your role is not only to be a lawyer, right, sort of in the stacks, but also very much about being visible, accessible, and to explain and enlarge the conversation around the law for people, um, for trans people, for the community, uh, which is the very unlawyerly thing to do, right? We yeah. had this conversation before about yeah. how lawyers are cloistered yes. and over time become more cloistered as they rise. Um, can you just talk about how you arri personally arrived at that decision to do that? Because that's a decision. Yeah, no, it's a choice. I mean, I think, I think in a few ways. I mean, I think I was, I was a history major in college, and I think that I learned to sort of question all mm. sort of narrative and sort of think about, well, how are the stories being told, being right. as significant as sort of living the stories themselves. Um, and when I look, when and by the time I got to law school, I had a deep understanding that our entire legal system is a system that was set up for purposes of maintaining chattel slavery. It's a system that is is anti-black and capital driven at its core. And so given- And anti-woman. And anti-woman. And, and so given that, like where you have actual human ownership, um, mm -hmm. and that was essential to the structures that were set up, that is the system that we're operating in as lawyers. So then am I going to use that system as a system of harm reduction, or am I gonna believe that that system is the answer? And I think, of course, I can't believe that system is the answer. So given that, if I'm utilizing it, then it is a, it has to be a holistic way of utilizing it and thinking, well, I have access to this information. My responsibility is to account for the harms that I may or may not contribute to, and also to share um, the information as broadly as I can, and ultimately, mm -hmm. Law is narrative storytelling just like any other. It's, mm -hmm. it's a theater. I mean, it's a, it, it, there are lots of ways we're producing norms through the, to the telling of stories in a particular set of constraints That's right. and power dynamics. That's and, so, right. and so making that visible and talking about it just feels so important um, because I've been able to see a lot um, because of how I get into spaces due to whiteness, due to lawyerness. Um, and then what can I bring out? Um, and sort of then try to 
to change, not relying on the legal structure itself to make the change, but relying on the power building and the community work to make the change. Yeah, I think there's I think there's a whole section of law or like, as you say that like, or research that has been doing, which is um, that the largely cases can depend on, on who tells the best and most convincing story um, yeah. that people believe. Right, and that's the trick, is to getting people to believe the story that you're telling, which is this weird combination between culture and custom and personality and all these other things. Yeah, and to push, like judges are not, judges are, are existing in the world that we're all existing in too, to, to different degrees and coming at it from different vantage points. But if we, if we want our narrative to prevail, then we have to build a world where our narrative has power. And that means changing the conditions that we're all operating in. Um, and, and also recognizing that, you know, it's like you can look at formal e equality and think, you know, the Civil Rights Act in 1964, passed in 1964, we don't have racial justice. We don't right. have, we don't have anything like that. You know, it's like Brown versus Board of Education didn't desegregate schools. I mean, we're dealing with the same fights today. That's because civil rights movement's over-reliance on the legal system is a problem so so that then if we think about our legal work as part of something bigger as part of you know sort of movements for change that aren't over reliant on, on law then i think that we can be more effective as advocates both inside and outside the courtroom yeah um well uh lisa says lisa anderson says that she loves the answer that you just gave in articulating um, the law inside of a moral framework, and that she also loves your tattoos. Oh, well, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Lisa. They are impressive, I have to say. Oh, thanks. Um, one of the things that um, um, Ash Stevens asks um, is, what are the, the ideas for how, moving forward, people can continue to mobilize around the case? Like, what are the thing, what can be done between now and, I think expected rulings are January? To June, I mean, really anywhere between January and June. So during the yeah. middle of the election season. Yes, exactly, during the middle of the election season. Oh, that's season. great. Yes. Um, <laughs> that's gonna be great. Um, yeah, and so how, what can, is it useful for people to do things? How should they continue to be engaged and to, to be mobilized? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question, and, 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 my, and the answer is yes, it's incredibly important to be mobilized, because I, I like to remind myself, at least, that the justices are humans. They, they go do things. I mean, they, they live in a sort of different world than like mm -hmm. we do, but they have children and grandchildren and clerks that work for them and people that see things in the world, and so if we show up in mass, whether it's on social media, whether it's physically, whether it's telling our stories, to demand that that we be seen and that it actually would be more social upheaval to rule against us, that tells an important story to the justices as they're deliberate. Right. Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. what they fear is that you know somehow this is some big transformative change to allow us to exist in the world. Right. And what we want them to see, and like yes, on some level we want to transform things, but the reality is we're also just existing. And that is right. also something that is important to, to, to remember, that like we just exist. We, we probably, you know, they probably run into trans people at the doctor's office, in their grocery stores, everywhere they go. That's right. And that, you know, not to say that we want to in make invisible our existence and, 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 and assimilate only into the norms that they find, in, you know, sort of acceptable. And it's also true that we already are a part of the norms that they find acceptable. And so it's a both and things. It's sort of saying, look, we're already here, living the same life you are, but we're not just like you. And that's okay too, because we have been ourselves for all this time and the law has contended with that and nothing has collapsed before your eyes. And so I think just sort of challenging um, this idea that yeah, everything will fall. That everything will fall and, yeah. that, and, and sort of, and then also pushing back and on sort of attempts to erase us, whether it's by the Trump administration, by state legislatures, so that then we are seen as to each other as being empowered and mobilized so that whatever does happen, we can capitalize on it. Win or lose, that ultimately we're gonna have to be unified and fighting for whatever comes next. Because either That's we win right. and there's a backlash or we lose and we need to mobilize. And That's so right. either way, we need to start to build those frameworks now. Right, so the, the answer is that, you know, essentially that this is just the beginning. This the is just the beginning, over, yeah. And so we have to continue to mobilize. You have to mobilize as if the case um, 
is not going to be one because as you say, either way, it's still tenuous. And what we, where we started this conversation was that even with the minimal protections that exist now, there's still massive discrimination. There's still massive lack of understanding. There's still massive attack. There's still So it's not that this case is going to clear, like there, it's all going to be clear blue water. <laughs> no, like, and actually. No more storms. But yeah, and, and in all fact. All rainbows and unicorns. The purpose of mobilizing around the case was twofold. One, it was to use the opportunity of the case to build power in the community. That's and right. second, and to make sure that whatever happens, we're ready. Because, yeah, it isn't going to be like sunshines and unicorns and rainbows, and well, that'd be fun. That's right. We're, we're, we're operating at a deficit no matter what, which means we have to build each other up and sort of engage in and support projects that are keeping each other alive and also, you know, sort of push towards um, telling our stories in every way that we can. So it sounds like, um, just to end our conversation, I can't believe it's been an hour. Yeah, it was fast. Uh, super <laughs> fast. Um, that it sounds like as we end this conversation that where you are is this mixture of sort of um, you, you know ho- hope and guardedness about the future and the law and trans people is that yeah I mean I think that I always have hope because I'm like we've been around we've survived so much people like with yeah. so who have dealt with so much more than me have pushed through so much more than I have and mm-hmm. and maintained so much like passion and and fun and levity at the same time and so that means like then we certainly can i think we should be aware that there will be many attacks that things will feel devastating and scary and that then those of us who have the ability to then push back in different sites we will do that and we will keep having that energy so it's like i will always be energized um and hopefully um that we can continue to build and that doesn't mean it doesn't it isn't scary it isn't violent it isn't wrong um i just think there's also room for like hope and connectedness and and good love and things like that and great tattoos and great tattoos and great purses yeah i mean Um, we have so much going for us i know right we're we're gonna win we're gonna win (laughs) we're gonna win thank you so much for taking the time after an incredibly busy week for yourself um and not only this week but just the entire run-up thank you personally for everything that you've done not only in the law but also to shine a public spotlight and to figure out ways to mobilize our entire community um, around this particular issue moving forward i think um as you say regardless this is still our moment right? yeah Thank um, you. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your tremendous questions. Make sure that you keep the conversation going, but be nice to each other in the timeline um, where you get to comment. Uh, you can also interact with us online um, on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and um, on YouTube and Instagram. Um, and as well, you can sign up for our weekly newsletter at translash.org. Um, in next week's newsletter, you'll get to see more of, of Chase. There'll be like a... Um, Uh, a link to this particular conversation and make sure that you share this conversation with your friends stay tuned for upcoming episodes of our lives at stake conversation where we'll continue to press and engage on the issues that are most pressing to our community have a great weekend everybody and thank you so much thank you